Um, yeah. It's my it's an honor to be here with all of you. And I want to say for those of you who are living in Israel right now, I just want you to know uh, I'm one of many people who recognize what the real stakes are and what needs to happen. And I, I, I was very impressed with um, the presentation we just heard. It was uh, heartening that there are people in Israel like him making that case, because I, I want to say something about that in a moment. But let me tell you about my book. The main thing to know is that most people completely misunderstand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That means both in the West and the United States, but also I think in Israel. Many people think it's basically a land conflict. It is not basically a land conflict. It is a conflict about what you would do with the land. So it's a political, philosophic question. What kind of society do you build? Do you build a society that's full of startups, of free people, of free speech, of innovation, of knowledge? Or do you build a society that is a dictatorship under Islamic law or under authoritarian nationalist law like the, the Palestinian Authority? Do you build a society that destroys individual lives? Do you build a society that it becomes a prison and a war machine? That is the conflict. The conflict is between two very different kinds of view of what politics is about. What is a good society? What is the, the basic direction that you're taking it in? And Part of what I argue in my book, What Justice Demands, is that that kind of perspective, which is a moral perspective, it's saying this is a good society and this is a terrible society. This society destroys human lives. This society makes possible flourishing for individuals. That's a moral question. And that's the key piece of this that people almost always drop out of the picture. And that's what the book offers. It offers a perspective on the conflict that brings that framework, that moral framework, to understanding both sides of the conflict, and there's more than two sides, but basically there are two sides, evaluates them by the same standard. So no double standards here. I think it's, you have to evaluate them by the same standards. How well do they live up to the ideal of individual freedom, supporting and protecting that? And I'll be the first to admit that Israel has many flaws, but that it's, it's nothing like what the difference between Israel and Hamas is. So Israel is like France, so it's like the United Kingdom, it's like the United States. It's, it's a place you would move to live to because it's good, basically. Whereas the kind of societies that the Palestinian movement has built have all, without exception, been authoritarian, dictatorial, theocratic. So that's the moral framework that I think is essential. And yes, there are questions about the land. There are questions about who should, what are the claims but you can't understand them absent that moral framework. So that's the essential difference about this book, which is it tries to explain the historical, very complicated issue, but bring clarity to it by identifying the essential nature of each side. How well or how badly do they, uh, how, how do they measure up against the standard of freedom? That's the essential thing. And the other thing I would say that I think is important in thinking about this, and I want to just come back to some of the discussion we've been talking about, which is the immediate concrete crisis or emergency, as you put it. The other thing that's really important for people to think about in this conflict is that um, you can't get away from the issue of what constitutes self-interest. That's, again, a, a philosophic moral question. And that applies to the Israeli government. That goes to the question that Aviram raised. It goes to the questions that um, our presenter talked about but didn't really get into because that, that's not his, not, not his space. But you can't get around the question of what is in Israel's self-interest, what is in America's self-interest, what is in the self-interest of all individuals living there. And that goes to the issue of do you believe that you have a right to defend yourself in the face of barbarians. That is, for most people, that is not a difficult question to answer. If you ask most Americans, do you have a right to defend yourself? Someone's trying to steal your car. They'll say, of course you do. And if you said to someone uh, in Europe, do you have a right to defend yourself if Russia invades you? Most sensible moral people say, of course you do. What changes in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that that clarity goes away. And what, what, robs people of that clarity is a perverse view of morality. It's the idea that you can defend yourself, except if the other side 
seems to be weaker, except if the other side says they're victims and they, they insist that they're suffering more than you are. If that is what the other side says, that that's their trump card, the Israelis, the Israeli leadership, I should say, the United Nations, the international community, including all the last five presidents that I've been uh, studying, they're completely disarmed. They cannot respond to that. That is a view that Ayn Rand called altruism. It's not being nice to people. It's this idea that you don't have a right to live if someone else is needier, if someone else is suffering more than you are. And that is the con, that is the fraud, that is the, the moral travesty that the Palestinian movement for 50 plus years has used on the international stage to give themselves cover for atrocities. Because the, the atrocities we're seeing now are horrible, but are they new? No. And we can talk about other cases of that across decades. So the fact that they do this sort of savagery, that is not new. Maybe the scale is new, and I think it is, and the surprise element is new. But what has enabled and empowered the Palestinian movement across decades isn't that they're strong. It's that they have gained and or they've taken the, the moral high ground. They've seized it un, undeservedly. But what has enabled that is that most people, if you tell them the Palestinians are weak and they are poor, that means in most people's minds is, well, how could you possibly have anything against them? How could you fight against them? They're going to suffer more if you fight against them. It completely erases people's understanding of your right to defend yourself, your right to live, your right to be free. So to me, it's it, on, on both levels, both the political level of who are these two factions? How do you evaluate them? And at the level of self-defense, it's a, what do you do in a crisis like this? In, at both of those levels, this is fundamentally a moral question. What kind of society do you build? And do you have a right, an uncompromised, unequivocal right to, to live? And if you do, then it doesn't matter who stands in the way between you and the people trying to kill you, including if they put human shields there. You have to be able to do that. And, I, and just the final thought before, uh, if you want to ask more questions, but the final thought to connect this to the question of uh, John Lewis's work. So John Lewis is a former colleague. He, he unfortunately passed away many years ago, but he wrote a book that is really powerful. It's a historical analysis of how different conflicts unfolded and what led to their resolution. And the, the basic argument he demonstrates is that wars end when you defeat the enemy. And he gave the, one of the best examples he gave is uh, um, World War II with the Japanese. And, and it's, it's a complicated story, but the bottom line is, yes, it took two atomic bombs to get the Japanese to stop. And I'm very much supportive of the idea that Israel should completely eliminate Hamas. And my concerns are not about the, the military capability or the, the, maybe there are better strategies than a siege. Maybe there's, I, I really can't speak to that. I think there are solutions to it. The concern I have is that on day two of whatever strategy is pursued, I guarantee you, I will put $100 on the table <laughs> right now, maybe more. I will give you, I, I will bet a lot of money because it's already happening that what will happen day two of this strategy is, well, these are war crimes. Israel is showing disproportionate force. It's not discriminating against combatants versus non-combatants. There's a, a well-known playbook that brings in the so-called international laws of war, and it works against good countries trying to defend themselves, and it doesn't work, and it cannot work against groups like Hamas that flout all principles of morality. So it's a one-sided principle, and it, it hampers the ability of good countries to defend themselves. So this is what to expect. This is the and I think it's not only that oh if Biden isn't supportive or if the UN isn't so those are all important and I agree with that. But what makes them lose their confidence, lose their ability to support Israel in this time of crisis and its unequivocal right to defend itself is this idea that if you're stronger, if you're wealthier, if you're more successful, you don't have a right to defend yourself. You don't have a right to live so long as there are three Palestinians who are bleeding in the streets. And I have compassion for, for people. I don't want to see people die. I certainly don't want any of this to happen. 
but that is the the kryptonite, if you will. That is the kryptonite that weakens the strongest powers on earth. It weakens Israel. It weakens the United States. And so to me, the idea that, yes, we, I've just written an article that says, after Israel's Pearl Harbor moment, which I agree this is, what it needs is nothing less than victory. And I agree completely with that goal. What I anticipate as the obstacle is not primarily a military challenge. I think the obstacle is the moral challenge of will Israel have the independence of thought and the courage of its own moral position? Like Israel really does have the high ground morally, but it doesn't usually recognize that. And so long as it's being told by a chorus of international voices, you're committing war crimes, you're bad, you're just like the Nazis, you're an apartheid state, that erodes the confidence of Israel. And what I think is the, the real crux that needs to, it's not the only thing, but it's a primary, it's a fundamental thing that needs to change, is that Israel's leaders, and I think some of them have the potential to show this kind of courage, they need to say, we don't care what you say. We know what the truth is. And you either support us because you agree with it or you get out of the way. And hopefully that is enough to get to, to shock people into this, because I think absent that we're going, I mean, my biggest fear is I don't have sort of the military perspective that our previous presenter has about what the sort of regional unfolding is. My fear is that this round is going to, is going to be exactly like 2021. 2014, 2012, 2009, 2006. For those of you living in Israel, you probably remember what those were. Those were previous rounds of rocket fires and uh, tunnels digging into uh, under the border. If that happens, th this is just going to get even worse. Because to me, just one final thought on this. So I, I, I'm old enough that 9-11 was a big event in my life. It, it sort of changed the direction of my career. I don't think this is like a Pearl Harbor moment. I think it's more like 9-11 in the sense that people were surprised about 9-11, but they should not have been surprised. It's not as if the Islamists of Al-Qaeda and other groups weren't already trying to harm America. They didn't. They already tried to bring down the World Trade Center years before 9-11. And when you look at what Hamas has been doing, it's not a, it's, the surprise is the scale, the surprise is the ferocity. It's not a surprise that they want to get under the border and take hostages. They, Whenever they could, they did it. Whenever they so, to me, it's are you going to break that lack of confidence, that cycle where you diminish Hamas's capability, but you don't destroy it. And the the final thought I will say about that is, I would be very. I, I think if you're the this is not a criticism of the presentation we just had, but one of the things I, I wish I had had the chance to to bring up is. If you can eliminate Hamas, that is a huge win. But what you need to do is eliminate it in such a way that we don't get Hamas 2.0, that we don't get Islamic Jihad, the, the sequel, that we don't get another group that says, yeah, but here's the problem. The, the, the Hamas people weren't religious enough. Because what you see in the Palestinian movement's history is groups going from being um, aggressive to more and more aggressive, such that it's it's sort of a survival, uh, uh, a, an evolution of greater ferocity and greater violence, because the last people failed to get the full goal of destroying Israel. So we have to become worse than they were. And if the, if the remnant of the goal survives, if the idea that Israel can be wiped off the map is still something somebody can think of as a viable goal, you will get another group with a different leader and different sponsors, and they will continue it. So it's the nothing less than victory has to be that you take a moral position that your right to self-defense is absolute. You carry it out in such a way that it's not just that Hamas was militarily weak and we need a better group. That goal cannot be pursued. That Anybody who even dreams of that goal will face the same retaliation that will be ended in that sense. And so, yeah, I mean, to me, that's the, the crux of it. This is a... a fundamentally a moral crisis that needs to be addressed. I, I don't have any question that Israel's military, if it's not already in a position where it has battle plans to do some of these things, it it, it has the, the ability to get to that. It needs the, the, the moral, 
I don't want to say backbone because that makes them sound like they're not confident and brave, but it's it's the moral strength, right? It's the moral scaffolding that they need. Um, so let me pause on that. And if you have questions, this would be a good time yeah. for it. So, Ellen, uh, first of all, thank you very much. And I very much agree with you. This is basically the intellectual and the moral battle, which is seems to be more difficult than the battle on the ground. And uh, our uh, future will be determined uh, on the outcome of this moral battle. 